27, 1977, three terrible things happened in the small town of Garrison. An infant was stolen from its crib, never to be seen again. A forest fire sparked just a mile down the road, and the first in a series of grisly murders rocked the town. All had one thing in common. They were perpetrated by what those in the town call the Shadow Mission. Lost among the forests and hills of West Virginia, Garrison hides away a dark history almost no one outside of the town has heard. Until now. Welcome to Strange Trails. I'm your host, Finn Mitchell, and over the next few episodes, I'm going to bring you along on my investigation into just who the Shadow Man is and what is going on in Garrison. Growing up, all of us have, I think, heard different bits of folklore or urban legends from our friends that supposedly happened to a friend of their friends, or someone in the nearest town or city. Usually it was something creepy, some unexplainable, vaguely demoniac event that was meant to leave us with a certain sense of dread. I heard my fair share of these tales at sleepovers as a kid, the hook-handed man stalking a pair of teens making out in a car, a serial killer licking a girl's hand at night, which she wrongly believed to be her dog, the hitchhiker vanishing from a moving vehicle, and one of the most pervasive legends, Bloody Mary. After hearing them, once the initial creepiness wore off, I used to wonder where these stories actually happened, whom they happened to. For almost all of them, a quick search online yielded dozens of results debunking them, and I very quickly stopped taking these so seriously. Though, I have to say that these dark things held my attention far beyond the initial version I heard. Full disclosure, I'm not just interested in things like this in an incidental manner. When I was a kid, my mother died in an, in an aggressively unnatural way, and I was the one that found her. I've spent so many hours growing up, reliving that period, wallowing in it, and the only thing I found that could take my mind off it for an extended time has, weirdly, been this fascination I have with the occult, paranormal, whatever you want to classify folklore as. So, every now and then, I'll hear about a story and I'll just sink my teeth in. The vast majority of them are purely fictional, which is the unfortunate reality of the situation. However, one of my closest friends growing up, Omari, who is producing the show with me, knows how far down the rabbit hole I've gone. When he heard a story involving this mysterious shadow man, he knew I'd be hooked. Okay, so explain for me this legend as close as you can get to how you told me the first time. My ex's sister, Brittany, told me. Wait, I thought it was his cousin, Kayla. Uh, yeah, right. I don't know. They were both there. Okay. Uh, we're hanging out at a party. And I don't remember what it was for exactly. Birthday, maybe. And a group of, uh, about five of us split off to shoot the shit on the deck. And we're out there for a bit. And then some girl heard a branch breaking in the backyard and a weird crying sound. She screamed and everyone laughed at her. It was just dark and it was probably just an animal fox or something. A fox? Yeah, they make those noises sometimes. Sound like a crying baby. But anyway, for whatever reason, Kayla came to her defense. Just not in the way you'd expect. She didn't tell us, hey, stop being dicks to her. No, she just sort of started talking about this story she heard. And she didn't call it folklore, but everyone else started calling it that. So that's what I went with when I told you. Hmm. I recall. So the story, according to her, was that decades ago in a small town, a few hours east of Charleston, a baby was stolen from his house. Thing was, the house the baby was taken from was locked. Completely. There were no signs of forced entry and no one heard anything. Neither the parents or their son. The little girl just disappeared from her crib. Not long after she'd been taken, a fire broke out just outside the edge of town. 
And right as people were first realizing what was happening in the forest, trying to alert their neighbors, call the fire department and whatnot, many people reported seeing this figure around the area. And he was wearing all black, just completely shrouded from view. And a few people insisted they heard a baby crying from near the person. Someone called him Shadow Man. And the rest went from there. People around here searched high and low for him. There's no sign of him or the baby girl. They say to this day, sometimes you can hear the baby crying in the distance if you're close to the edge of the forest. And when children are naughty, he emerges from the forest and punishes them with this slow, painful death. And now this weirdo thinks decades old cold cases are worth investigating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think it could be interesting to see where these stories we all tell each other come from. You know, <laughs> Let's find the origin of the story. That was the seed. All I set out to explore was a bit of folklore dating back to the 1970s. What I found about that time was not only a nascent serial killer, but a horror that reached all the way to the present day. Before we dive into the myriad of atrocities that have been attributed to him, I want to explore who this shadow man is. To do that, I had to first find out where these events had taken place. It took a long time, but after spending a few weeks at the library sorting through envelopes of microfiche, miniaturized reproductions of newspapers, catalogs, and other documents, I did eventually manage to confirm that Garrison was the town described in the story. The wildfire and missing baby both split the front page of the Garrison Courier from Sunday, October 2nd, 1977. In the middle of the article about the fire, mentioned almost in passing, was... Here, let me quote it for you. The body of Eugene Osborne was found outside his home on North Hill Street by his mother. He died of apparent smoke inhalation from the fire and is one of three known casualties of the blaze. Now... That might not seem to add much right now, but there's certainly more to his death than smoke from a fire miles away. Once I had the location figured out, it was impossible not to go visit to see the area firsthand. To begin, I wandered the streets of Garrison with Omari, asking those passing by what they thought of the legend. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you a question? About? The town. What do you know about the Shadow Man? Wait, where are you going? Is this some kind of joke? No, I'm doing an investigation. Don't waste your time. Sir, do you know something? Sir? Sir? I felt like I had lost an opportunity after he walked away, because clearly he knew something. And I was kicking myself for not getting a more direct answer, but... His reaction had just caught me so off guard that he slipped away while I was still processing it. Thing is, it ended up not mattering that we missed out on him because that same type of almost indignant reaction to my investigation kept happening. Oh, excuse me, sir? Do you know anything about the Shadow Man? Excuse me? Shadow Man. The killer who took the baby and set fire to... You're not from around here, are you? No, I'm from Los Angeles. Um, we're here to investigate what's been going on with the folklore. Investigate? Uh, Why? Our police couldn't solve it, but you think you're going to figure out who the baby killer is? I mean, yeah. that's the hope. This town's dealt with enough already. What? What is going on here? Oh, just let him go. They don't seem to like us. We kept walking, but even though it was the middle of the day, there weren't very many people out and about. Along the streets, many of the telephone poles had advertisements for garage sales or offers of babysitting stapled to them. One advertisement, with all of the stubs removed, bore the address of a local woman who did haircuts out of her home. As we continued down Main Street, toward the western edge of town, the businesses lining the streets slowly switched over to houses until we were in a fully residential area. We were within sight of the Mill Creek Bridge, which leads out of Garrison and directly into the forest. It's the only road out of town that leads to another community within two hours. The other exits just lead further into the wilderness. We circled back and ended up in a small park not long after. As we strolled through, 
We came up behind a bench where a guy was quietly applying a nicotine patch to his shoulder. Right as we reached him, he rolled down his shirt sleeve to cover it and lit a cigarette. He looked anxious as we approached, like he had been expecting to be alone in the park. Eventually, I gathered that his name was Cameron Findlay, and he'd grown up in the town. We're just looking to see if you've heard anything about him or had any experiences with Shadow Man at all. Big, tall guy. Fast fucking runner, that's for sure. I went to the school late one night to use the track a few years ago. Only time I could get it to myself. On the third lap, I see a dark figure in between the sets of bleachers. I assumed it was a coach, teacher, I don't know. And then he stepped forward into the light. Black hoodie, gloves, a face mask on, the works. I ran all the way home, refusing to look back the entire time. Where's home? Arrow Street, on the west side of town, right near Mill Creek. 15 minute jog. <laughs> Seven if you're sprinting. Did he follow you? For a bit, and he almost kept up. I could hear his footsteps. So people are still seeing him around? I thought the murders were over. They are, for now. Maybe not, who knows. But people still see him around all the time. Well, I don't love that. What do the police say? You told them, right? Said they'd look into it. That's the last I heard from them, though. But we had one of the lockdowns a few days later, so there must have been a bunch of sightings around then. How'd you... Listen, I'm on a lunch break right now. Trying to relax a bit. I don't really want to be thinking about stuff like this, so if you could... No problem. Thanks for the information. If Shadow Man wore gloves, as Cameron said, it'd explain why there were never any fingerprints found near where he'd been sighted. But Cameron's description helped to form a picture in our heads of the person haunting the garrison streets. We continued our tour of the town, asking everyone we walked by whether they'd be interested in talking. Almost no one took us up on the offer. It wasn't long before we were at Back Road, the road spouting from the southern edge of town leading toward the now-defunct Sanderson Mine the town used to rely on for jobs. There weren't too many people in this area, just a few small shops here and there. You think there are any psychics out here? I want to get my palm red. I'm surprised you believe in that stuff. It could be fun. Nah, let's just turn back. We need to go find some other people to talk to. It is strange how no one will talk about Shadow Man at all. They clearly know what we're referring to, but something oh. just... What? He's cute. <laughs> let's talk to him. Omari. I would just like to submit for the record that this is a horrible way of conducting an investigation. Hi, my name is Amari. I'm Jordan. I'm here with my stray friend, Finn. Hi. We're doing an investigation. Oh, uh, in, into what? Have you ever heard of something called the Shadow Man? Oh. He nods, thinking through the rest of his answer. I have. You look like you have more you want to say. Um... Have you ever had any sort of experience with him? <laughs> Well, there's the nursery rhyme the kids teach each other at school. Ooh. Can you perform it? <laughs> I haven't thought about it in a while. L let me see. Um, across the bridge, he comes this way, hurting children to this day. Uh, salted earth, hollowed ground, uh, fire rage neath lunar shroud. Sacrifice a life cut short, free the scourge to hunt for more. Out past sundown, you're on his land, so get inside, away from Shadow Man. <laughs> it's not a great rhyme or anything, and it's, it's not even accurate. Accurate? <clears throat> um, what are you guys doing this investigation for? Curiosity. Well, I do actually have something I can add. It, it's not much, but... Anything is helpful at this point. We're just finding puzzle pieces right now, and we'll fit them together later. This was a little while back, a couple months ago, right before the last lockdown. That's recent. <laughs> I guess. There was a huge crash very early in the morning at my house. Something heavy fell over in my basement. It woke me up for a second, and then it, I, I rolled over and fell back asleep. A few minutes later, Bryce knocked at my door, waking me up again, and 
asked if that had been me that made the noise. Who is Bryce? Oh, sorry, my dad. Your dad? You don't get along with him that well, do you? <laughs> uh, things could be better. But anyway, I, I told him no. It, it came from below me. He didn't seem to believe me, but there's not anything that heavy in my room except maybe my dresser, you know? I wanted to go back to sleep, but something felt weird. He sleeps in the room directly below mine, so wouldn't he have known that sound didn't come from my room? Once I was out of bed, I, I heard him downstairs opening the door into the basement. It drags along the floor when the wood expands, and when he went down there to check it, nothing had been touched. I joined him, and there was nothing that had been knocked over that would explain the sound, but I mean, it had to have come from there. All the other rooms in the house were unused except for where my mom was sleeping, and, and she didn't even hear the noise, and nothing fell over in the den or the living room either. And then outside, I, I checked for footprints. I thought maybe somebody had tried to break in, but there were just deer tracks around the storm door, so I, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Bryce suggested it might have been the cat that knocked something over, but she was upstairs sleeping on my mom's bed with her, and I mean, she can't get into the basement without being let in. Did your siblings hear anything? I, no, he... I don't have one anymore. Anymore? My brother Devin was... it's complicated. How? Did Shadow Man do something to him? No, he just... he overdosed. Whoa. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it was a few years back. How old was he? 24. But, but that's not what I was getting at. The, the, the crash in my house just reminded me of the night before. Something I'd ignored. I could hear a few voices talking around 1 a.m. when I left the bathroom, ready for bed, but it, it sounded like I left the computer playing a video or something, but when I checked it, nothing was playing. I heard the voices for a little while longer, whispers almost, and then fell asleep. When Bryce woke me up, the voices were still kind of audible, like they were coming through the air vent. I could hear them clearly. When he went down to the basement, he said the radio was turned on, and that's what I would have been hearing, but how would that have turned on? My mom was upstairs with the cat by the time I started hearing the voices, so it's not like she was down there exploring and her paw flipped a switch or something. It wasn't an alarm setting or anything? It's just a radio. It doesn't even have an alarm function. So I don't know. I, I just... I think someone was in the basement that night, and with the lockdown happening a few days later, I'm pretty sure if it was anyone... It was Shadow Man. Does he normally do that? Break into houses? He's mainly here to terrorize, so I wouldn't put it past him. Well, who were the other voices that you heard? Then? I don't know. Uh, maybe it was just the radio, but I mean, somebody had to turn it on. And what about the murders? He's killed five kids, but so many more people have seen him and been stalked by him. He usually shows up late at night when you're alone and vulnerable. Did you see anything else? Hear anything? Uh-uh. To this day, I'm convinced Shadow Man was in my basement that night. I'm not sure what made that loud noise, and I'm not sure how he got in the house in the first place. He shakes his head at the ground, furrowing his brow. We checked the doors that day, and they were all locked. None of the windows were open either, and the police never found fingerprints anywhere. What if he was wearing gloves? It wouldn't shock me. Why do you think he didn't attack you? He only kills kids. If he was going to do it, he would have done it when I was younger. One year, I just turned eight. I was running around the forest by myself, exploring. Looking back, what the hell was I doing? It was like the week before one of the murders, too. Crazy stuff. It's weird to think about. <laughs> Never did that again. Which murder was it? Ah, this little girl. Her name is Nicole Taylor. Everyone has weird stuff happen to them around here. We all kind of have each other's backs, you know? We have to. After we left Jordan, we continued walking the streets for a bit, not really getting any new information. Almost an hour or so had passed at this point, and traffic was picking up as people returned home from work. It was in this rush that we came across a group of three people, Samantha Edwards, Jesse Abel, and Gabe Howard. We're wondering if any of you have had an experience with the Shadow Man. Gabe shakes his head vigorously, mimicked by Jesse. 
Samantha, though, bites her lip for a second, glancing quickly between Omari and me, as if she's silently debating, revealing something. I haven't talked about this in, oh god, years. What? Did you ever try to run from your shadow as a kid? Once or twice? I used to do it all the time. No siblings, so when I didn't have friends over, I would be left by myself. My shadow was my imaginary friend, always with me. But sometimes I'd get in fights with her and want her to leave me alone. So I'd run as fast as I could, but she'd always stay right with me. It took a while, but eventually I figured out I could go under a tree or into a building or, I don't know, anywhere that was all shadow. And then she'd vanish, and I'd finally be alone. One day, I was playing in my backyard. I live over there. She points toward the residential area, nestled right against the tree line of the forest. Swinging all my swings, begging my shadow to push me higher since my legs were only getting me so far. I wanted to try to go all around the bar. (laughs) The thing is, I can't be positive, but I like to think I knew my shadow wasn't real. Like, I didn't actually expect it to push me higher. I was just playing pretend. Which is why it was so surprising when I felt a hand on my back, giving me a shove. It pushed me way too hard, though, and knocked me right off the swing because I wasn't ready for it. It Knocked the wind right out of me. But in those moments when I was trying to force my lungs to take in the air, I swear I saw a dark, shadowy figure running away from the sunlight and back into the forest. And there was a ringing in my ear from the fall, but it almost sounded like a baby was crying nearby. As soon as I was able, I got up and ran inside, scared out of my mind. Tears just streaming down my face. I probably made no sense at all when I told my mom what happened. My shadow pushed me off the swing. That's what I knew it as. From then on, she was not my imaginary friend. I played games alone. But every now and then, I'd look out my window, and usually right in the middle of the day, I'd see a shadow just standing there, a couple of trees away from the edge. Did you ever tell your parents about what you were seeing? I tried. By the time they'd get to the window, it'd be gone. And in my little kid brain, it was just my shadow, waiting to be invited back to play. (laughs) But even then, I held a mean grudge, and I never forgave it for pushing me off that swing. Gabe, what's that look on your face? That's what you saw? You had that happen to you? Yeah, it was super traumatic. And no one believed me when I told them about it, so I just stopped telling people. I, uh... Oh, God. What? I didn't think I'd seen him, but I... It was years ago. He was outside my window, too. Oh, my God. Uh, Oh, my God. I yelled out the window at him. There was a baby crying nearby, too, for some reason. It was weird. I was home alone. He could have... Oh, my God. I, I I was so high, I was sure I was hallucinating. I'd ordered a pizza, and in my head it was the pizza guy refusing to bring it to the door. I lost my shit, and then the actual pizza guy, when he showed up a few minutes later, he must have been so confused. I'm sure he sees people blitzed out of their minds pretty regularly. Did the figure you saw do anything? Did you ever see him again? No, it's like he was just... observing. He didn't respond to anything I yelled at him. I was so close to running out to flip on him just for being there. I feel like an idiot. How did I not realize that? You probably should have called the police. Or your dad, at least. His dad's a cop. Well, what are they going to do? Show up 30 minutes later and then say there's no one there? Not worth it. What are you hoping to get out of this? Me? I want to figure out who the Shadow Man is. All this started almost 40 years ago, right? Yeah. And yet the experiences you've had are so recent. This person, even if they were 20 when this began, would be 60 now. That's insane to me. The idea of a 60-year-old man creeping around and terrorizing a town? Yet somehow no one's caught him. The police are... Where are the police on this? They must have leads of some sort. Yeah, I'm going to check with them. But first I want to focus on what the people living here think of this, though. And then I'll focus on the crime. Just a suggestion for you. Maybe check with some of the retired officers. Or at least one of them. Like who? Keith Wilson. (sighs) Oh, God. Not that guy. Why? What's wrong with him? We'll just say... He didn't retire by choice. I don't know that it's a good idea to go chasing after this. You don't know what you're going to run into. We'll be okay, I'm sure. Thank you for the chat. Anytime. Maybe she's right, though. Who? 
Samantha. We don't know what we're gonna run into. I didn't know Shadow Man was still around making appearances. Kind of interesting, huh? I thought this was all in the past. That's why I told you about it. Hey, do you remember a few years ago when all over the country people were seeing clowns everywhere? Yeah. I mean, that was clearly just a bunch of people hopping on a bandwagon to freak others out. There's always people out there who, for whatever reason, enjoy tormenting others. And luckily in that case, no one got injured. But in this case, there are crimes that we know happened. People died, and they're still seeing the Shadow Man everywhere. I don't know if it's another case, like with the clowns, where it's someone or someone's doing this right now just to carry on the legacy or whatever, but I want to know who it is. I want to know how it's still happening now if it's been going on for 40 years. You think it's a copycat? Well, the crimes, from what we know, seem to have stopped, and now he's just appearing places. I don't know that it can really be considered a copycat since they're not committing the same crimes, but I also don't want to just go into this assuming it's not the same person doing this as it was originally. It's totally possible it's the same person, but then the question becomes, why has he changed? Or rather, is he doing the same things, but people haven't discovered his more recent crimes? He kidnapped a baby. They don't know why. But people would notice if the infant went missing around here. But my question is, where are the rest of the bones, right? Where's the body? Oh, that's a good question. I'm just... I'm so confused right now. I thought if I learned about him first, I could take that knowledge and use it to understand why he committed the crimes he's accused of. No, I should stop saying he committed the crime, since we don't know that for sure, but the evidence does seem to point in that direction. Everything I've learned as of right now just makes me scratch my head harder, though. That forest fire? Why start it? What did he gain out of that? And he, so far, hasn't started another one, but why not? Yeah, and then the child murders. Exactly. The murders. Started a decade apart, getting progressively closer together, right? A new child, different family, but then he stopped after 2009. The last murder was July 7, 2009, yeah? Mm-hmm. And both Samantha and Gabe's experiences happened after that, though, so he was still around, but he didn't kill anybody. This is a bizarre case that I think would be really difficult to piece together as an officer, just based on everything going cold for so long between murders. There's so much to find out about this person. Is it, is it for instance, somebody in this town? Someone they all know but don't suspect? Or is it some outsider from who knows where strolling in and causing havoc? Maple Ridge, the nearest town, it's over an hour away. So how practical is that? Because if it's not someone who lives here, it's someone who's putting in a lot of effort to be here. So my question is, who are they and why do they want to be here so badly? Over the first few days we spent interviewing people, there were a surprising amount of stories like this. These almost encounters with the Shadow Man, where, for whatever reason, he never harmed anyone or spoke to any of them. A few residents did end up describing a crying baby nearby during their experiences, though it wasn't a consistent feature of their accounts. Despite these few anecdotes offering a glimpse into the actions of the Shadow Man, it became readily apparent after that first day that we needed a more direct plan if we were going to get any closer to figuring out his identity. Canvassing the town was only going to help so much, so we started researching names and places that came up in the news reports about the crimes. Many of those people who showed up have since passed, and most of the older generation that is still alive is oftentimes very unwilling to discuss what transpired. Almost everyone in the town who was willing to talk had at one point or another come across the Shadow Man. None got a good enough look to be able to describe his features, which, as an officer in that town, must have been so frustrating. Omari and I had discussed our fears on the way to Garrison, and for both of us, the idea that we might not find anybody with new information was at the forefront of our minds. And there was always that nagging voice at the back of my head, telling me that Shadow Man was just a bit of folklore, and there wasn't even any new information to get anyway. If anything, this was all based on a deranged killer from 40 years ago, who at this point was almost certainly dead, or very close to it. But if it was just a tale, there wouldn't be as many people with unique, direct experiences as there are. Over the next week or so, we scoured the town, collecting as much information as we could, but things started to change pretty quickly. After a few days of asking around, we'd catch people peering out from behind their curtains after we knocked, 
or sometimes even as we were walking up the driveway. And then they wouldn't answer. It was like word of our arrival had passed through the town and everyone had been warned of what we were asking about. Over the following days, we continued canvassing the town, sometimes getting conversations with people and other times getting shooed away. On rare occasions, though, we were referred to someone else. And that's how we met Ava Cook, someone who'd lived in the town her whole life and could speak with first-hand experience about just what the Shadow Man was capable of. Ava still lives at home, saving up, she says, to move out of the area. Her house is one of half a dozen identical buildings on a cul-de-sac, and it's a cozy, homey little place. As we walked in, scented candles were lit, the smells of cinnamon in one room and apple pie in another wafting together through the enclosed space. The hallways are filled with pictures of Ava and her parents on vacations or at family gatherings, and beside them, school pictures and baby photos of another little girl, this one a brunette to Ava's blonde. Teacher of the Year awards are framed on a packed bookshelf, one each for Mrs. Cook, teaching 8th grade science, and for Mr. Cook, teaching high school English. We cut through her kitchen and ended up in her living room at the back of the house, sinking into the couches that had clearly seen a lot of use in their time. This was a family that loved having guests over, perhaps to make sure the house was never empty. So for the sake of those listening, we'll just say here that we found you through your friend Darcy. Yeah, I really should catch up with her. How do you know her? She was kind of vague when we spoke at her house. We used to go to school together. I'm surprised she remembered me. Well, not surprised she remembered me, just that she thought of me for this. <laughs> I can't blame her, I guess. One summer back in middle school, the three of us spent all our free time running around through the forest, planning out this big camping trip we wanted to go on one day. We thought we'd hike all the way to the exact middle of the forest. Not sure how we would know we were there, but we insisted we would know. And then we'd spend the night and just live off the land out there. If only we were older, we insisted. Sorry, who is the three of us? You, Darcy, and... Madison, my sister. Oh, is that who the little girl is in the pictures? Ava nods curtly, her mouth closed tight. So, Darcy, you knew her pretty well then? For sure. We actually used to be neighbors. Oh, she moved away? No, uh, we did. Well, this place is almost directly across town from where she lives. After everything that happened, we just couldn't be in that house anymore. What happened at that house? <laughs> it didn't start there, so maybe I should start with where it began. Yeah, wherever works best for you. As I said, Darcy, Madison, and I were practically inseparable. This was the summer Darcy and I were 14. Madison was 10. She always wanted to come along when Darcy and I would go out to play. Usually we just hung out at one of our houses playing video games or watching TV. But in the summer it's too hot to be stuck in a stuffy house all day and we would instead go cool off in the shade of the forest. There's a path just at the end of the street that leads in a ways. At school, Darcy and I had heard that not far beyond the end of the path, there's a secret lake that no one knows about. Weird looking back on how no one knew about it, even though everyone apparently knew about it. We decided one day it was too hot out to stay home, and even in the forest it was too much because there was no wind, so it was just muggy and uncomfortable, and we were getting cranky. That was when I suggested trying to find the swimming hole. The three of us had never gone past the end of the trail, We'd gotten to the end, but always stayed within sight of it, just so... You know, we were 14, but we weren't stupid. We needed to be able to get back home. Plus, our parents were pretty strict about that. We had to be within sight of the path, so if they came looking for us, they could find us. But that day, that hot, muggy day, I said, hey, let's bring our swimsuits and go find the swimming hole. It couldn't be that hard to find if everyone at school knew about it. Whatever our parents said wouldn't matter, we'd be back before they knew we were even there. We got our things and we were off. It takes about 15 minutes of hiking to get to the end of the path, and then you're on your own. 15 minutes into the forest, that's beyond yelling distance. No one from outside is going to hear you. That's, I think that's what's always stopped me before, knowing that if we lost where the path was at that point, we were on our own. 
Cell phones aren't an option out there. We're in the quiet zone. And unfortunately, that day was so hot, I was willing to take that risk. We hiked a bit beyond the end of the path, looking at the ground to see if any other kids had left tracks that might lead to the swimming hole, and Madison found them. They were footprints, like someone had walked through the forest barefoot, but they were covered in soot. It was like blackened, singed-looking footprints. Tough to describe. Someone got dirty, we figured, and they were trying to wash off in the lake. They veered off, and we followed them, trusting that they would lead us where we wanted them to. And they did. Do you want to take a minute? No. Uh, <clears throat> I've told this story so many times. It's worth it to get it recorded now so I never have to again. Okay. But if you ever need to stop, though, we can stop whenever. Don't feel any pressure. It's okay. So. Okay. We found the lake. Much larger than I expected. Maybe a hundred feet across, if not more. It was beautiful. Just how everyone at school described it. The tracks led us there perfectly. I think the issue for us was that we never actually noticed there were no tracks leading away from it. Oh my gosh. We swam for a while. It was fun, the water was refreshing. Honestly, it was a perfect day. No other kids ever showed up, so we had the whole place to ourselves. There's a little waterfall from the stream out of the mountains, so we were jumping into the water and everything, splashing and laughing and... I'm sorry. Sometimes I just need to live in that happiness again. Because at the end of our time there, when the sun was getting low in the sky, that was when I had this weird feeling. Darcy and Madison didn't seem to notice anything. They were still playing Marco Polo. But I just... I felt like we weren't alone. Not that we were being watched or anything, but that someone else was around, could hear us. So I told them to be quiet and start getting ready to go. Madison complained. <laughs> That's just what she did, so I had to convince her to get out of the water. At this point, I was out and dried off. Darcy had gotten out and was toweling off. But Madison... Ugh, she wasn't ready yet. I tried a trick my mom used on me all the time back then, telling her we'd come back another day. But have you ever had to tell a kid to get out of a pool? No amount of anything is going to convince them to leave their fun in the present, especially when they don't get to go swimming all that often. We argued a bit, and I yelled, and she finally got out of the water. At this point, the whole forest was in shadow. We couldn't see the sun anymore. I wanted to get home, or at least get back to the path where I'd feel more comfortable. At least knowing where we were in that moment would be enough. The hike there had been maybe another 15 minutes on top of the 15 to the end of the path, so we were a good half hour hike deep into the woods as little girls with no cell phone service. I totally get why our parents didn't want us that far into the forest. It took forever, but I managed to get Madison going, heading up and following the black footprints we'd followed there. Darcy followed her, and I took up the rear. To this day, I don't know if looking behind me as we left the clearing was ultimately a good thing, or if it ruined my life for no reason. But I did. And in the middle of the lake, someone was treading water. It was too dark at that point to make out features. We turned around to start walking maybe 20 seconds earlier, so I don't know how they got into the middle that quickly, and we really weren't that far away from the water. We should have heard them getting in, or at least moving through the bushes or something. I held in a scream. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I didn't want to scare Madison. And Darcy, I love her, but she would have freaked out more than Madison, so I kept it to myself. If they'd been actively swimming towards us, I would have screamed and sprinted for sure, but instead I played the older sister and hurried Madison along. Really hurried her to the point where she was starting to get obstinate and refusing to walk anymore. The sun's going down, Madison doesn't want to walk, there's someone behind us and we're out of range of help until we heard voices coming from the direction we were headed. They were a bunch of boys, maybe 20 of them. Some of them were from our grade and some were their brothers from high school. I think they were going to try to skip the curfew. They breezed right by us on their way to the swimming hole for an early evening dip, I guess. 
Around here, a lot of kids disappear into the forest for a bit when they want to go smoke or drink, and I feel like that's what the older boys were up to. The younger boys probably just actually wanted to go swimming. I told the boys we were headed home. Five of them volunteered to walk us back, which was so nice of them. On the way back, I tried to look for the black footsteps, but with the entire crew of people walking that way, they'd been trampled out of existence. We got home safely and everything seemed fine, but after a few days, I started having nightmares. I would wake up, and in the corner of my room, the dark, shadowy figure from the swimming hole would be standing there. I couldn't move. I could barely breathe. It was horrifying. And then my body would actually wake up and I'd be able to move again. Luckily, my parents were aware of this stuff and they explained what sleep paralysis was to me. In another life, it would have solved my problems. Just knowing what's happening is sometimes enough to help you get over a problem. But here, in Garrison, I don't know if it was just sleep paralysis. I'm still not convinced my room was actually empty all those times I felt like I saw the figure. One day, I was over in the kitchen, right by the door, filling my cup with water, when my dad walked through the hall, out the front door. I watched him go and shut the door behind him. A few seconds later, he came back in. I could see him out of the corner of my eye, and he walked down the hall to the study. I think he forgot his keys or something. My cup was full, so I went to go help him look. But his study was empty, and so was every other room in the house, except the living room, where Madison had been sitting watching cartoons, and my parents' room, where my mom had been napping for over an hour. I woke her up, going in to check and see if Dad was in there. He wasn't. I looked in the garage, and his car was gone. He'd actually left the first time. So I don't know who walked back in right after he walked out, and I don't know where they went. But the only sign I found that proved to me someone was there was a small puddle of water right by the door and successively smaller ones leading down the hall like... Wet footprints. Yeah. I showed my mom, but I was holding my cup of water at the time and she just sort of gave me a look and left. I didn't spill though. I know I didn't. Do you think it was Shadow Man? I don't know what it was. I do know that I didn't hallucinate it. The door opened and closed. Someone was there, until they weren't. Anything go missing? Anything had moved? Did you call the police? Well, my mom knew, and when he got back, I told my dad. They were in the camp that I'd been hallucinating, then pointed to my sleep paralysis and said I was sleep-deprived and seeing things, which was so frustrating to hear. But now, I look back as objectively as I can. I have to, or I'll go insane. But looking back, if your daughter was having night terrors and not getting enough sleep, and as far as you know, these are just totally out of the blue, since I couldn't tell them about what I'd seen at the swimming hole because we weren't allowed to be that far into the forest, it... their reactions make a little bit more sense. Okay, little girl, you're not getting enough sleep, and now you're seeing things. Try getting more sleep. Here, take these sleeping pills. That's what happened. I got drugged. Oh my god. Not in a these-are-shitty-parents way. My parents love me. I don't want this to come across like they did anything wrong, given the information they had. But if that was the Shadow Man, which a huge part of me believes it was, then that means I saw the person who murdered my sister. Whoa, Shit. what? Not that night, but not long after. Whoa, hang on. Your sister's dead? Madison? Oh my god, I'm so sorry. July 7th, 2009. How do you know it was him? He always does it the same way. Always? So, your, your sister was the last one of the Shadow Man's victims? Yeah. How's this not come up before? No one you've spoken to has mentioned it? People weren't very keen on giving out the victims' names, and we're still figuring out what it is that we're even looking into here. For sure we would have found out eventually, but wow. This town, for as forthcoming as some people have been, really seems to like to hold on to its secrets. No one gives up more information than they absolutely need to in any given moment, and that can be frustrating at times. Though, it became clear very early on that this was not just some folklore like we'd set out to explore. Naughty children were not the sole victims during Shadow Man's dreadful reign. Shadow Man, whoever he was, existed. And what we'd heard beforehand were just the parts of the story that had slipped out of the town one whispered secret at a time. 
Ava was the first person to really dive into her experiences here, and I assure you, you will hear from her again. But as far as setting the stage and getting you up to speed on the mystery that is the Shadow Man of Garrison, this felt like a good place to take a pause and start really thinking about just where this investigation might lead and whether Omari and I were willing to follow it to the end. Coming up, this season on Strange Trails. You can't trust him. Maybe we're all somewhere in life. It's just a matter of when we become the victim. He's just staring at me. Well, don't stare back. He's not blinking. What is it? How is he doing that? You hear a lot of things in this town. It'd be foolish to think all of them are true. Turn that fucking thing off now. You cannot be here. Hey, let's go, Finn. Strange Trails stars Matt Winton as Finn Mitchell, Dominic Kim as Omari Mason, and Ashley Every as Ava Cook. Additional performances by Veronica Kim as Jesse Abel, Michael Ursu as Cameron Finley, Riley DeCoke as Jordan Harris, Parker Billings as Gabe Howard, and Ella Shava Glazer as Samantha Edwards. Created, directed, and edited by Colton Woods. Script supervisor, Fernando Galazzo. Special thanks to Katie Joyce and Courtney Woods. Visit us at strangetrailspodcast.com for more info. Strange Trails will return in The Vanishing of Margaret Lee.